Welcome back to Keep Swinging, man. We have an awesome guest today. He's an absolute legend in the hockey world and in the sports world. And if you're unfamiliar with him, well, you're definitely going to love him after this, just like the over 2 million hockey fans who voted him the best feel-good moment of the 2020 season in the NHL. We got David Ayers, emergency backup goalie in the house. David, thanks so much for joining us here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Dude, well, we're stoked to have you, man. You were a, a bright light in a very rough year for a lot of people in 2020. So, yeah, this is going to be great. And just to give a little bit of background about yourself, we saw so many headlines. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, what your current job title is, and at the time of the appearance in the NHL, your job title then. Yeah, well, back then, uh, a year ago, it feels like forever ago now, but uh, I, was, I was managing a university hockey rink or sports complex for Ryerson University in Toronto, but I was also the practice goalie for the Maple Leafs and practice goalie for the Toronto Marlies, and I was actually with the Marlies, I think, for eight seasons in total as practice. Did a couple, uh, had a few backup games with the Marlies, I think three or so like that I think I did and then uh, I was at every leaf game as the emergency goalie so now I'm at my home working for a company that does all the refrigeration systems for all the hockey rinks in Canada and the U.S. so a little bit of a stay-at-home job uh, obviously with COVID I kind of had to take a little bit of a different angle it shut down everything I was going to be doing right so <laughs> had to take a little different angle and uh, think long term. That's right so when you did go into you know, the NHL game a lot of people had mentioned how you're a Zamboni rider. You just talked about how you've been playing hockey now for like the last 10 years in Toronto. And also, too, you're, you're just always around the ice hockey rink. You're a big ice hockey fan growing up. And your emergency goalie position with the NHL, can you just describe that to people? Like what happens when you get to the arena? How early do you get to the arena? Because your story right here is all about being ready when your name is called in. And it's just so remarkable what you're able to do. Yeah, the NHL came up with that rule. Well, I guess they're going into the fourth year now. Obviously, they're not using emergency goalies during COVID. But uh, when they came up with that rule, I was practicing with the Marlies. And as their general manager moved from the Marlies to the Leafs, he knew me well. Obviously, I was with the team. And uh, it has to be somebody that doesn't actually work for your organization. So that's one of the big myths. Everyone says, I drive Zamboni for the Leafs. I didn't drive Zamboni for the Leafs. Like I did for the Marlies years and years ago, probably uh, six or seven years ago now. And that kind of story stuck. But uh, as an emergency goalie, you just you have your equipment at the rink. Uh, you're there. You have to be dressed up just like one of the other players. You're there minimum an hour before the game. And you basically just have something to eat and, and, and watch the game up in the stands. And Sarah and I usually stand in the same section, section 317. There's like a big standing room kind of staying out of the way of all the partiers up in the top with their, uh, with their beers, which <laughs> obviously I'm not allowed to drink or anything like that there. So I'm not really a drinker anyways, but you know, they like to party up in the top sections of the, of the, of the rink. Right. So it's fun to be in that atmosphere, but um, yeah, you, you, once a goalie goes down, your phone's obviously buzzing and, the, uh, the Leafs organization gives you a, a text message and said, get down here and, and start putting your gear on just in case you have to go in. And I think that was my fourth time I had to get dressed, third time that year. And uh, obviously the only time I had to actually play. I'm happy that you set the record straight about the Zamboni driver job because there's so many headlines out there saying that you were the Zamboni driver and then people just think that you hopped off the thing in the in the middle of the period yeah. and hopped on <laughs> hopped onto the rink. So thank yeah. you so much for clearing that up. I, I definitely want to get that straight with the viewers and the listeners. <laughs> I, have a, I actually had a contract with the NHL as Toronto being my, my home base. So uh, it wasn't something that they're like, hey man, like <laughs> just go out there and get off the machine. You got to go out there and get ready, right? So I wasn't working. My, my only job is, is to be there dressed up as uh, basically one of the players. And uh, <laughs> the Zamboni thing is, uh, it's, a long, it's a long time ago, but uh, people read it. If you're going to put Zamboni on something, people are going to read that, right? So uh, good for them for, for figuring that one out. Now, dude, like you said, your phone can go off at any minute, depending upon the health status of the goalies. When you get to the stadium and you're with Sarah, your, your awesome wife, do you ever just want to kind of like crush bruise or just eat terribly like any other hockey fan would? Because you're in Toronto. That's that's like a bucket list uh, arena for a lot of hockey and sports fans. <laughs> it's a great it's a great rink, but we we walk in early. We get to kind of cruise the concourses and get to the concession stands before everybody. And usually, you know, I'll, I'll go straight from work to the game, or I've practiced in the morning, and then I have to go to work, and then I have to go to the game. So it's been a long day. So sometimes. 
we're starving. So we'll hit the concession stands up and uh, Reuben sandwich. It's pretty popular in my stomach during before one of those games. Uh, and there's another chicken sandwich that's there that we usually have. So we were pretty routine. You know, goalies are pretty superstitious. So we kind of go in the same door. We always, I, always, I had my parking spot. But nice. you, know, you do the same routine as you go. And, and it was just kind of like you couldn't really break it. And three years in, you know, sure enough, you get called in after I had a crushed Reuben sandwich probably 20 minutes before that. So <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> I was sitting on a full stomach and really heavy legs because I did a, a really heavy leg day that uh, probably at two o'clock that day. Sarah and I decided to go to the gym for a light day. And next thing you know, I'm like, oh, my legs are feeling strong. And I just start crushing the weights. And, and I'm actually, we were driving to the rink and I said to her, can you imagine if I get called into the game tonight? Like, I'm going to be terrible. <laughs> my legs are so sore right now. <laughs> so then sure enough, you get called in. That was the night. And that's actually a perfect segue. And before we get there, does Sarah, would she go to all the games with you? And also, too, does she get to have some fun? Are you the DD on the way home? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She's not, she's not a huge drinker either. Uh, maybe before she met me, but obviously because of my kidney transplant, I don't really drink that much. So she kind of follows that train. She doesn't want to be the only one <laughs> drinking. So, uh the odd time she'll have one but uh yeah she just enjoys the game she loves it and she's there for everyone amazing and this was period one of the interview and in period three we're going to get to her and you mentioned your kidney situation which again guys if you don't already love dave after listening to this first five ten minutes we'll get ready because we got so much more coming right now again that that night like you said you had such a long day you had worked you had done a heavy leg day you get to the arena, you're crushing a Reuben sandwich, and then your phone goes off. Just just talk about that entire experience uh, leading up to that moment and getting that call and going into the locker room. Yeah, you know, like I said, it was the third time I've had to be called down this year. So actually when the goalie got hurt within the first, whatever, six or seven minutes of the game, uh, I actually text uh, the read from the, from the Maple Leafs. I said, oh, Reimer's down. And he's like, yeah hold on one second and two seconds later it's like all right let's go get down here so I was kind of ahead of the game at that point because I was used to what was going to happen and um, you kind of just go down there and, and get ready and like if what's been your third or fourth time getting ready you're not you're not expecting to go in because before you just got ready and you sit there in the dress room and watch the game with some of the guys or in my case some days I'm by myself with my phone on my lap half dressed in my equipment right so you don't expect it you just think yeah I'm gonna go down there I'm gonna get half dressed you know sit around and watch the game on my phone and undress it and then you know head home uh and then obviously you get the call so life is a little different after that so are you nervous and and what's Sarah saying as you guys are in the standing room section and, and you just finished eating like what's what's going on through your mind and this is on February 22nd 2020 Dave gets called in to an NHL game as the emergency backup goalie because two goalies on the Carolina Hurricanes went down in a game against the Toronto Maple Leafs in the second period so yeah what types of uh, emotions and nerves are going through you you know when you get the call it's like it, you're at the top of the stands so to go down the stands you're like kind of running down the stands and they're so steep and I'm, I'm old and I got sore knees. So I was like, Oh man, just don't fall on the way down, on the way down the, the stairs. Right. But you know, Sarah is a, a, a bag of nerves. Like she just carries her bag of nerves everywhere she goes. Once they get called in, she's freaking out and you know, we're running down to the truck to get my gear out. Cause I had played actually with a bunch of my buddies the night before on Friday night. I don't normally play with them, but I, I didn't, uh, I took my gear home and, and I played with them. So my truck, my gear was still in the car, probably still a little bit wet, but, uh, you know, when you get your gear on, it's just like, all right, I'm going to sit here by myself. So it's not really, I'm not really nervous. I'm kind of used to it at that point. But once the guy comes in and says, Hey man, like you might be going in, my phones are going off saying like, get in there. You're going to do awesome. But I didn't actually see the guy get hit. So I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. And got I'm hit kind hard. Of, yeah. Yeah. I got inundated with text messages and they're all like, you're going to do awesome. And I had no clue. Um, <laughs> I didn't even see it, him get hit until after the game. And I watched the video of him getting smoked, but that's when the nerves kind of kick in and the excitement, more excitement, like all these years of being on the ice, you know, during the season and even off season, you're training with a lot of the guys and, um, you put in a lot, a lot of work over the years and this was your time get out there and kind of do what you've been doing for so long. Right. So, uh, you get excited and, uh, nervous, but once you hit the ice, let me tell you, I've been on that ice a million times with the Leafs or Marley's practicing. The place has been lit up like crazy, but there's been no fans. You put 20,000 screaming fans 
when the place starts to rumble under your feet, that's when the nerves kick in, right? You, you're trying to keep yourself get focused for the game, but you can't because you can't hear anything and, you know, the place is rumbling and that's when the nerves kick in. So the whole second period, I was a bit of a disaster. Now, a lot of people, when they do get nervous, they get the butterflies in their stomach and also, too, their legs kind of feel weak. Your legs are already <laughs> feeling weak yeah. at this point. <laughs> like, yeah, they were numb. I think they were numb pretty much the whole game. <laughs> I think halfway through the third, I was like, wow, my legs are tired right now. And I, was, I didn't really have to do a ton. Like, Carolina played unbelievable in front of me, so I didn't really have to – I didn't have a heavy workload. But all of a sudden, that adrenaline kind of dumps a little bit. You kind of get just in the comfort zone, and then that's when you start feeling the sore and heavy legs. You know what's funny is that every single time that I work out and I'm on, say, like a, a, a Soul Cycle bike, at usually around like the 45 minute mark or an hour towards the end of the bike ride, I'm trying to dig deep. And I always visualize in my head, just because growing up I was a huge hockey fan and, and Marty Brodeur fan. I'm from New Jersey. And I'd always just picture in my head, like, what was Marty's legs feeling like in the crease in like the overtimes of the Stanley Cups? Like, they were probably so oh, tired, yeah. but he just kept on going. Now I think I'm going to have to replace Marty with you <laughs> when, <laughs> yeah. when I'm on the bike, just thinking yeah. about you with the leg day, going down all the stairs <laughs> at the arena, yeah. and then going into the game. It's amazing. Yeah, it was uh, not an easy day on the legs, that's for sure. But, you know, in, you're in that situation even when you start feeling your legs get tired, you look at the scoreboard and you're winning. It's like, you're, there's no way you're letting your legs overcome the feeling of what it's going to be like to actually win in an NHL game. So you, you just obviously dig as deep as you can and emotionally and physically, it's like, we're finishing this off. There's no way I'm going to be lazy out here now. Now you said it was kind of wild that there's 20,000 people in the stands after going from zero during practice because you were practicing with the team. When I had Manon Rayom on the show, she was the first ever female to play in any of the four professional major sports in North America, and that being the National Hockey League. She said that as much media craze as there was when she had her appearance with the Tampa Bay Lightning, that as soon as she stepped on the ice, there's just this familiarity with being on the ice. It's just that game that she's been playing her entire life. So in this case, you did have like your reps with the Toronto Maple Leafs playing with them, even on the three on three outdoor tournament. This is a game that you've been playing your entire life. So as nervous as you were, at what point, if there was a point, did you kind of like settle in and say, Hey, like I'm here for a reason. Yeah. I think after the second goal, obviously two shots, two goals, not the way you want to start your, your game. So, uh, you know, I just kind of sat there and I looked up at the, at the jumbo Tron and I said, uh, like, you can't go out like this, man. Like you, you're, you're better than this. You can't just have two shots, two goals. Like the next one's not going in and you dig deep. And then that's when you actually get yourself into focus and start doing what you got to do. And I just said to the guys after the second goal, I said, just get me to the intermission. If I can get to the intermission, I can regroup my thoughts. I can take a deep breath and kind of sit there with the guys and, and kind of get back into like game mode. And, um, that's the thing. Reimer came and sat beside me. He's like, man, you've been doing this forever. You know what you're doing out there. Don't worry about anything else that's going on around you. Just go out there, make the saves, just like settle in and just play your game. And that really helped me kind of get back into the focus and ready to go. And I said to the guys right before we went onto the ice in the third, like score one more goal. I'm going to lock this down. We're going to win this game. And the guys just looked at me like I had three eyes. And they're like, who is this guy coming in with all this confidence that we're going to, he's going to shut the door in the third. And I don't even know why I said it. It's just how I felt at that point in time. And I just felt like I'm going to that third and I'm going to kind of play my game and, and let's go. Right. So third period, I, I was comfortable and I actually wanted more shots. It was funny because the players would get the puck, even in the Leafs end, the Leafs would get the puck and people are in the stands yelling for them to shoot from the, from the other end of the ice. Right? <laughs> it's like, all right, like, shoot. You know, I, the more shots I, could have had in the third the better i would have felt you know you get out there and you make a couple saves and then you're you start to get into your element i love that when you came into the game you said that you were talking to a lot of your teammates and and just seeing in the highlights a lot of the uh, teammates and the defensemen they'd come on over and just give you stick taps on the pad and just like smiling that had to have lessened the nerves and everything um and then listening to the broadcast and you hear these two broadcasters just talking about how this is not the situation that the Carolina Hurricanes want to be in. Um, Dave has only played here, which is a level below here, which is a level below here, which is, and it's just like, they just kept on going on. So as I'm watching this unfold, I'm like, man, not only is he proving the commentators wrong, not only is he surprising a lot of these fans, but 
the game after the second period, like you said, let up two goals was now 3-3. And then in that third period, you didn't even let up a goal. You stopped all the shots that were coming at you. And we're talking about players like John Tavares and, and, and Austin Matthews. Like, no joke. Mm-hmm. As a viewer, that, I just thought that was awesome and just so happy for you in that moment. Yeah, you know what? I was thinking about this the other day. It's like I, I'm, I would have loved to have played for the Leafs because, you know, obviously practicing with them for so long and being part of that organization for so long would have been great to get into a game with them. But being on the opposite side of the guys that shoot on me all the time in practice, I think it made me feel a little bit more comfortable, right? Because you're used to those guys shooting and you kind of know where they're going to go and you know their tendencies. But I think if I had went in against another team where I didn't know anybody, you have no idea um, where they're going to go. You've got you just kind of have to wing it at that point. Uh, so, you know, it helped me a little bit kind of knowing the players that were shooting against me. And I think they had a little bit of respect for me. I know one of the guys said to me the next day at practice, like I had the puck and I came over the blue line and said I was going to rip it, but I was either going to get booed if you stopped it or I was going to get booed if it went in. Right. So he, uh, he's awesome. But he, uh, that's that kind of mutual respect, but I don't think you know, they didn't take it lightly on me. Uh, Carolina, uh, shut the door pretty well. And, you know, there was a bunch of times where a couple shots from the slot were pretty good reps. And, you know, at that point in time, when there's a guy on you, they're not going to say, oh, Dave's in it. I'm going to shoot it soft. Like they're ripping it. You know, it's just that's in their head where it's like we're in game mode. We're shooting all the time and we're doing the best we can. Everything just seemed like it was a perfect storm. And even you letting up two goals as much as maybe you would not have liked to have let up two goals, that allowed the game to be tied 3-3, which then allowed you to get the win. So you you got a perfect one and zero record right now. <laughs> yeah, I'll take the I'll take the record. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, if I retire at one and zero in the NHL, uh, I don't think I'll ever complain about that one. That's for sure. People always say, "Hey, if you get another chance to go in, do you want to do it or do you want to keep your perfect record?" So it's one of those things you'd love to get back in the in the net because next time I'd feel more comfortable. But do I want to lose? I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, no, I bet. Now, at any point during this game, did you get an opportunity to look up into the stands, into that standing room section, and see your wife, Sarah, there? I looked up for her, actually, one time, and I couldn't see her, and I knew she had gone somewhere else. I think they moved her down or whatever. I knew she wasn't going to stand up there by herself, and she was just telling me the story where I came out onto the ice, and she, like, grabbed some random dude beside her, and she's like, that's my husband, and they're like, what are are you talking about? So she kind of made friends in the stands at that point, but I know they moved her around uh, in the stands and kind of gave her a spot to sit down. And somebody asked me in the media scrum after, they asked if I, uh, if I talked to her. And I said, oh, is she alive? She hasn't had a heart attack? Because, <laughs> you know, like I said, she's a bag, she's a bag of nerves. Right? Like, I don't know if she was, uh, I don't know how, what she was doing, if they had to take her away in the ambulance or what, but uh, she survived that one. And how are you feeling? I know that as soon as you got off the ice, <laughs> NHL representatives were right there waiting for you to take your stick to send it to the Hall of Fame. But like, what was going on through your head and, and what type of sense of accomplishment did you have going on? Did it, did it hit you in that moment? Uh, no, not really. I think, you know, the, the thing I remember the most is catching that last puck. You know, I think it was Kyle Clifford came across the line, shot it on net. I kind of grabbed it. I looked up and there's like 1.8 seconds left to go. And uh, I just thought to myself, I'm not letting go of this puck. Like this is mine. Right. And next thing you know, the guys are all jumping around and having a lot of fun. And uh, at that point, as soon as you step off the ice, you're like, yes, let's go, you know, kind of celebrate with the guys. And then I get halfway down the hallway and one of the people from the Leafs, like you're going back out, you're the first star. And uh, I don't even, I didn't even think about that. Right. But as you're walking out of the tunnel onto the ice, you know, I've been to many Leaf games and Leafs lose. And if they lose kind of in a bad way, the fans are gone within five minutes. I step on the ice, three quarters of the building is full and everybody's standing. So I was going to take the traditional visiting team, quick little twirl and get off the ice. But I'm like, you know what? I got to enjoy this. I went out and skated probably halfway out the ice and then turned around and came back. And uh, so, you know, you, you know, that's probably the only time you're going to be on the ice and you're going to be the first star. And, you know, it doesn't really click into your head that you've accomplished much until, you know, you get home or on the ride home. Like Sarah and I are just kind of, that was cool. Like that's an NHL hockey game. I was just saying, and we ended up winning in a pretty cool fashion. And, you know, you just, it's like a relief of all those times where you've felt terrible and you've gone to the ice of practice or you're sore, you're hurt and you kind of go and, you know, uh, that's, it gives you such a bigger respect for all athletes to go through everything 
you know, I, like I said, I was practice. I got put in there and took, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of shots every single day. Uh, and you go home bruised and battered. And for these guys to have a long career, you know, 15, 16 year careers, people don't understand the, the, the effort and just what these guys have to go through to do all this. It's not easy on the body. And then when you retire, all your injuries start to come out and, and you're hurting. Right. So uh, big respect to all the guys that have long careers. That's for sure. Man, you just gave me the chills. I got like a long <laughs> sleeve shirt on, sweatpants and everything. <laughs> so there's so many different things that you said just now that I want to touch on. I guess one of them will be that even during that last shot, like you said, as soon as you caught the puck, I was watching it with my wife the other night. It was just such a great moment. You know, like it was like, this is how it was supposed to end. And like you said, three quarters of the arena of the hometown team stayed to see you just do that quick loop of being named the first star of the game. That really started a love affair with you and NHL fans and sports fans. Like we started at the top of the interview saying that over 2 million people voted you the best feel good moment of the 2020 season. Dude, that's, that's, that's insane. Like think, think about like, again, how much of a bad year 2020 was for people and how you're able to be just such a bright spot in people's lives what does that mean to you and also too just seeing a lot of the 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 videos swirling around the internet like rod brindamore's post-game locker room speech just hyping you up and just speaking with so much heart like what does all this mean to you when it comes to what you mean to everybody yeah like you said it was a tough year in 2020 you know there's ups and downs for for everybody and you know i was fortunate enough at the beginning of the year obviously to have this game and impact a lot of people i got so many messages from just even friends not friends like just random people that said you lived out every guy's dream who who played hockey you know just for the normal guy um to get out there and play in a game and win the game like that puts a smile on my face and i just love to to hear the fact that people were here when they watched the game or they're here and then they watch the game and it's like they got the whole family together, which, you know, people don't normally watch hockey, but they turned it on to watch it because it was so cool. And everyone, you know, was happy and smiling. And um, it's awesome to hear that it could kind of bring a smile to people's faces. And I've said this before, if it wasn't me and it was somebody else who did the exact same thing, I would think that it was a great moment and I'd be happy for that person. But I'd be loving the fact that in sports, you can have a moment like this where you bring in a guy, especially in the NHL, because I don't think any other kind of sports league has a, an emergency kind of person that they kind of bring in. Uh, but you have somebody that's like, hey, this is somebody that people don't really know. They don't know the background of this person. So they get thrown in there. They're just the average Joe, and they kind of go in there and succeed. And uh, it's a feel-good story, that's for sure. One thing that we haven't mentioned, and in my opinion, age is just a number, and it definitely is, I'm, I'm sure for you, but we haven't even mentioned your age, which 42 years old at the time of this appearance, like it's, it's, it's never too late to live your dream or have this type of positive effect or accomplish such an extraordinary goal. So what is your advice to people out there who maybe they're older or they don't think that their goal is as close as it as to them as they think? that it actually really is, or maybe they've been working at something for 20, 30 years. They still haven't gotten it. Maybe they see the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of success, but like, just what's your advice to people out there who are just looking to be inspired and and looking to just like keep swinging towards their goal? Yeah, I I think I kind of was lucky. My parents were always the people that would kind of drive you to do your best and have fun with it at the same time. Uh, They never really pushed me to do anything that I didn't want to do. Um, but they did instill, um, kind of goals in me to, to better yourself, keep bettering yourself, keep trying and don't give up. Like, obviously I had a kidney transplant 16, almost 17 years ago now. Um, and when I had that transplant, my one goal was to be able to get back on the ice and skate at some, at some way. Like I wanted to be able to play hockey again. Um, and then as you kind of progress, you're back on the ice. And then I got lucky enough to get in with the Marley's, uh, team and, and help them out and, you know, I was never looking to get into the NHL. Uh, but I wanted to do is not let something like a kidney transplant beat me. And uh, I'm a competitive guy. Uh, I like to stay in shape. Uh, like you said, being 42, you know, it's just a number. There's lots of guys out there. Like Rod Brindamore, the guy's 50 and he's an absolute specimen. So uh, it's just, you know, you put in the hard work and 
things will come. Like if you, if you give up, that's when things obviously aren't going to start going your way. And um, I just don't give up on, on anything. It's like, uh, that's kind of one of my models, I guess, in life is just do everything you can uh, as hard as you can. Um, and good things will come your way. I think uh, hard work will definitely pay off. Guys, if you're not already falling in love with this dude after the first segment and the second segment of this conversation, I'm sure you are now because he just mentioned something that is just out of this world. 16, 17 years ago, you had a kidney transplant and you were able to overcome those trials and tribulations and get to this point and God bless healthy right now and and, and over time. But just the fact that you're able to do that and beat the odds and just handle everything so well. This entire time, you just had a smile on your face sharing this story. You're just like another regular dude, you know, and, and, and I hope that everybody out there listening to this and watching this on YouTube takes note of that because a lot of the guests that we have on this show, they're extremely successful at what they do. They rise to the occasion just like Dave does. They're just regular, normal people and very, very down to earth. And Dave, you're such a great example of that. Yeah, thanks. I think, uh, you know, athletes or whatever you do for your, for your profession, that's what you choose to do. Really. I think, uh, it doesn't make you any different of a person than, than anybody else. I think, you know, that's your job, that's what you're good at. And you kind of have your own, your own values and your own goals in life. And, um, just because I mean, for me, I, cause I ended up getting to play in an NHL game doesn't make me any different than, than anybody else. You know, I kind of keep doing my life the same way that I did it before the game. And, uh, and I'll continue to keep doing that. I think, uh, you know, just a part of my life that happened to be a great experience for me and um, getting to meet so many great people afterwards. But uh, it doesn't change uh, who I am as a person. I, you know, I'll always be the same, the same kind of guy and uh, keep working hard on anything I do. Now, I know you're extremely humble, but I'm going to bring this example up because I just think it's awesome. <laughs> but your wife had tweeted out a video of you stopping pucks during a, a team's ice hockey practice. And she took this video because you're with this team and they didn't have a goalie, but you're walking across the rink and you saw that they didn't have a goalie. So this was even after your practice and you just like stepped onto the ice and let them shoot on you for about 10 minutes so that they could get their practice. And that says so much about your character and about the type of person that you are. Yeah, that was fun. I think I, in total that day, I was on the ice for almost three hours between the Leafs and the Marlies. And you have to go from one rink to the next. So I walked through the lobby and Sarah was with me and, and I had to cut across the ice to get to the, the Marlies dress room. And before I went on the ice, I'm like, they don't have a goal. And these kids were probably 10, 11, maybe. I said to her, I'm going to go out here and, and kind of hang out with these kids and stop a couple of pucks and let them shoot on me. And, and uh, she was kind of like, really? Like, yeah, this is going to be awesome. I love this. It brings you back to being a kid again, right? So I went out there and, like you said, just kind of did practice with those kids for 10, 15 minutes. And they loved it. I loved it. It, it, was, it was, you know, a little bit of a different pace, but it was so much fun to see these kids smiling and laughing. And I was the same way. And, uh, yeah, I love to do that kind of stuff. Dude, it's so awesome. So where did your foundation of your character come from? Was it your mother who was an absolute angel and donated her kidney to you, which I definitely want to talk more about that, just that whole entire situation. If you can go a little bit into it, just about like your upbringing, but also to your mom and how she stepped up to the plate with the kidney donation. Yeah, my family growing up, like I said, my brother was a goalie. My dad was a goalie. We were a sports family and it pretty much revolved around that. But my parents were great. Obviously, my dad was coaching me. My mom would drive me to the games when my dad was with my brother and everyone always had each other's back and always kind of were very uplifting and if you felt down they kind of picked you up and uh so that's the same way you know I've always been that type of person and obviously you know the day I found out that I needed the kidney transplant my mom was actually sitting right by my side and uh once the doctor said hey you need a kidney transplant both your kidneys are, are gone pretty much my mom said how do I sign up where do I go how do I get tested let's get this thing started right Right then and there, she wanted it done. So uh, it was exactly a year from the time that I found that I needed a transplant to the time I actually got one. And my mom went through all the testing and uh, she was adamant that she was going to be the one to, uh, to give me a kidney, which isn't normal. Usually one of your siblings, it's a better match than, than it is one of your parents. But uh, my mom was, was right there and, and she, wanted to, uh, she wanted to do it. She wanted to get it done. Wow. So this is kind of like your NHL appearance where something, something happened which 
doesn't happen very often. And then you were there to step up to the plate right away Mm -hmm. and save the day. And this is exactly what your mom did. She said, oh, my son needs this. All right, here you go. It's incredible. Yeah, she didn't, obviously it wasn't something that was really thought about. Like we knew uh, probably three months before that, that I, my kidneys weren't doing great, but they said it was blood pressure that was causing my kidneys to fail. So they were trying to get my blood pressure under control. But in turn, it was the other way around. It was my kidneys failing. My blood pressure went up because of it. So it wasn't something that you were expecting like, hey, you're going to need a transplant. We thought, you know, with a little bit of medication, we'll clear this up and we'll be back to normal. So like I said, the day that I, I found out, it was kind of a shock to everybody. And, and like you said, my mom stepped up and uh, right away, she was like, let's do this. So uh, maybe that's probably where, where I got it from. Wow. Dude, such an inspiration, man. So just just like knowing all of this and, and everybody learning a little bit more about your story, what's the best way that somebody can help out? And how have you been able to help out and give back? Yeah, I've been lucky enough where I I got to work with the Kidney Foundation of America and the Kidney Foundation of Canada. Uh, We've done a couple of webinars and uh, the Canadian Kidney Foundation, we did an emergency fund when COVID really hit and a lot of people going through kidney disease and stuff like that. They've all needed resources and we raised over $100,000, I think, in three weeks for the Kidney Foundation of Canada and a portion of the t-shirt sales from the Carolina Hurricanes. When they said to me, we're going to make t-shirts with your name on it, and you get a certain amount of profit from these t-shirts. I said, well, is there a foundation down there uh, in North Carolina area that we can uh, donate money to as from a portion of these this t-shirt sales? And they found that the headquarters for the U.S. Uh, Kidney Foundation was in Charlotte, I believe. So wow. we went and, and donated donated proceeds from the t-shirts uh, to to them as well. So that was one of the things I wanted to do right away. I said, let's donate money. And uh, if it wasn't for me having a kidney foundation or a kidney uh, transplant and the help of all the foundations, that I wouldn't have been where I was at. So uh, trying to do a lot to give back and, and just raise awareness for organ donation. My mom was out of the hospital in four or five days after giving me a kidney. And she's never had a problem since, knock on wood, but she's never had a problem since. Uh, she was out gardening like a day or two after she got home. So um, it's not that bad. And, and I hear now, I, I just talked to a guy the other day who just had a transplant and he said the operation was very simple compared to the way I went through it and compared to the way my mom went through it with the technology that they use now, the operations are, are a lot easier. So, um, you know, organ donation in general, uh, I'm kind of a big advocate for that. I want to make sure that people realize that you can save so many lives giving up your organs. If you pass away and your organs are in good shape, you can save so many lives. So, um, I always kind of push for that. Yeah. Uh, the, the stucco household is on the same page as you. We have that on our driver's license and it's such a easy, simple way to save somebody's life and do good for others. And even like you said to the, the, the t-shirt sales, can people still go out and buy the t-shirt and the proceeds go to this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the Carolina hurricanes shop, they're still selling the t-shirts and the proceeds are still going to, uh, the foundation. So, Kidney Foundation and in Charlotte, so they can still get out there and they can still do that. Yeah, I bet that people are definitely gonna cop some after this, man. Like, how could you not yeah. root for Dave? Shoot. <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, the people in Carolina are amazing. They're so so nice. Like all the people there were great, and and everything they did uh, while we were down there. Obviously, we were supposed to go back in the end of March to do a bigger autograph signing and meet some more people and, and stuff like that, but that COVID got shut down. But once uh, once they got a chance to get back there, I'm going to uh, make sure I get back to Carolina and, and we'll meet a bunch of people and just kind of get back to that area again. It was awesome. So awesome. And before we go into the bonus round, we'll wrap up with this, but with all this attention that you got, and we were just talking about your T-shirts as I was doing research, I was checking out anything, whether it's jerseys or memorabilia. Do you know how much your card goes for on eBay? Like a serial numbered out of 10? Like just no, take a guess. Someone sent me something the other day. They were looking for one of my cards and it was 50 bucks for the for a Young Guns card. But I know I sent, I signed 150 upper deck cards and that was all they gave. And uh, last I heard, one of them sold for eight hundred fifty bucks. <laughs> wow, yeah. man, that's a lot. That is, that is a lot. I saw uh, one without your signature. I think had gone for around like three hundred, four hundred. But one with the signature and only one fifty. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so take that, right? Let's use this as an example. <laughs> <laughs> knowing, knowing all this fan craze and media attention, everything that you've brought to yourself and to the sport, how have you been able to handle it? And has it changed at all since the time that you played in the NHL game on February 22nd? Because to me, it sounds like it's it's still obviously there and still growing. And, and even uh, just this past week when they were talking about goalies that I believe it was the Oilers or maybe it was the Sharks. It was somebody. It was one the of Oilers. The, yeah, Oilers. You see the tweets being like, oh, bring up David Ayers. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, my name comes up quite often. You know, I, I didn't have <laughs> Instagram before the game. And then my agent said, man, you got to get Instagram because people are making fake accounts of you all over the place. So let's get you an Instagram account. Let's get you verified. So they were, uh, they were adamant that, that we did that. But, it, you know, I think it's almost every single day, even throughout this whole pandemic and everything that I get a request, someone wants me to be on the podcast or do a, a, a Zoom call with their school or, you know, just kind of have a chat and uh, something comes up every every single day. So it's not really slowing down and uh you know just about to sign finish signing up my deal with with disney to make a big movie so that's going to be kind of so that'll be kind of cool so you know i think that uh things are going to start ramping up again here now things are going to get you know a little a little more hectic coming up here pretty wild a little bit so it'll be it'll be a lot of fun right it's just uh something cool it's it's a cool experience and uh who knows where life takes you after that you just got to keep on riding this wave. And is there anything that you can share about the movie that you have coming out with Disney? And I have listened to past interviews and you have thrown out a couple of people out there who you'd like to play yourself and, and, and your wife. But is there any sort of information that you know about the movie already? Uh, so right now we're kind of just doing a little bit of seeing who's going to write it, um, talk to a bunch of the, the writers and just kind of get the whole... Um, plot of the movie kind of sorted out and, and which direction we're going to go with it. So um, obviously COVID slowed things down a little bit. We we're hoping to get the movie out within a couple of years, but who knows what's going to happen now. So I'm kind of, we're, it's a little bit of a holding pattern right now, but uh, no good details yet. <laughs> nothing great to, nothing great to share yet. Who do you want to play you? Has that changed at all? Or, or still Ryan Reynolds? I keep on hearing that name get right. thrown out there. Well, you know what? Someone brought that up to me a long time ago uh, about Ryan Reynolds would be great because he's a Canadian guy. He's a good actor. You know, I think he'd have fun with it. And, you know, there's nobody specific. You know, a couple of the producers mentioned, you know, maybe someone like Mark Wahlberg would be interested. So that would be cool too. Like, I follow him on Instagram. He's a funny guy and he's he's a he seems like a lot of fun. So, yeah, I don't know. There's you know, Those two guys would be great, you know. Um, just anybody really that would enjoy the role and, and actually have fun with it. So, cause that's like me. I, like you said, I like to have a smile on my face all the time and uh, just enjoy life. So it'd be someone like that. Those two are going to have to put on some serious muscle if they decide <laughs> to play you and get your role. You're, you're a big dude. And like you said, you love to have a smile on your face. And I want everybody who listened to this and watched this to be able to see that smile on your social media platform. So where can everybody follow you? Say what's up and keep in touch with you. Yeah, uh, David Ayers is my my handle on Instagram. Um, it's the, I think there's a bunch of them, but I'm the one with the with the blue check mark. It's it's verified. They call it. I guess you know I'm not a huge social media guy. I'm not very good at it, but I'm um, taking tips from people. People send me messages and say, "Hey, you should post a picture like this," or "Hey, you should you know do something better with your Instagram." Right. So it's always good to get people that are good with social media to help me out with this one. Awesome. Well, hey, man, we got a lot of content coming your way. I'm going to be tagging you a bunch and everybody out there is going to get a nice dose of David Ayers on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. So, dude, man, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate you coming on the show. You're such an inspiration, man. And we're all looking forward to uh, this movie and what happens for you next. So, David, thank you so much for joining us on Keep Swinging, man. Yeah, absolutely. It was a great, it was great fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for watching that episode of Keep Swing. Man, we have so many more awesome guests on the way, and I don't want you to miss any of it. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, feel free to go back and watch past episodes. And again, if you subscribe to the channel, that is the best way to find out who we are going to have on the show next. And if there's a guest that you want on the show, I will do all that I can to have him or her come on. So please leave a comment. Let me know who you want to see on Keep Swing coming up. And also, too, feel free to leave a comment what you thought about the episode in the comment section below. 
give it a like. And if you head over to Instagram, I'll be posting clips from all these interviews, just a little daily inspiration. And there you can interact with me as well. Until then, have an awesome day and keep swinging.